and welcome to Interruptible Mass. We are here to help us all transform state policy because we know that we could have a state with policies that support the vast majority of the residents who live here. And today we are going to be talking about Earth Day and climate and all that good stuff. Um, we will talk a little bit about um, the things to think about aside from carbon emissions. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the role of corporations and government versus our role. We'll be talking a little bit about coral reefs, the, some lawsuits coming up or that have happened, um, fast fashion, American culture, cover a bunch of that stuff. But before we do, I will have my co-hosts introduce themselves and I will start with Jordan. Jordan Berg Powers, he, him. Um, and I live in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, and I have, um, it's been a long time since I've done this, honestly, so I'll do it, honestly. Um, I have uh, I have 30 years experience working in electoral politics, and I have um, I had over 10 years working as the executive director of Mass Alliance, which I am no longer at, and I am now consulting, um, and that's my real bio. <laughs> nice. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Cohn, he, him, his, uh, joining from Boston at what I call the intersection between Back Bay Fenway and the South End, and have been active on kind of issuing electoral campaigns here in Massachusetts for a little over a decade. I am Anna Callahan, she, her, coming at you from Medford. Um, been doing uh, environmental stuff, wow, for 30 years, maybe? It's my oldest policy, um, but uh, local and state politics for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. And I am a city councilor in Medford. Um, and now let us move right along to talking about climate. Earth Day just happened. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really every day should be Earth Day. <laughs> but, um, but in the spirit of uh, talking about the earth and climate change and all of that, we want to go ahead and cover a number of topics. Um, Jordan, you just look, I can see you're, you're just riling to jump in here and talk, uh, say something general about Earth Day and about, you know. <laughs> yeah, as, as people know, I get riled up about this. Uh, just really quickly, I'll say uh, that we talk about Earth Day, we talk about all this stuff wrong. Um, it is not just simply uh, the Earth, although the Earth is wonderful and important, but rather just our ability to live on it. Um, we make it sound like it's something else, but it's actually we are endangering our children, let alone ourselves, ability to live here like now. Um, and all the things we're seeing, the increased wind, the increased um, uh, uh, weather events, all those things are a result of our actions. And we these are our actions. We are doing them. And when I say we, I mean really Americans, mm -hmm. like we are doing this. And so um, there's a lot of things we say that are um, to try to make it rationalize it or make it somebody else's problem, but it is you, me, my problem. And it is, um, there are, we all, obviously there's different people who have more power, so they have more power to actually make change, but we all have the importance to do more and take it seriously. And we don't, Americans do not take climate change seriously. You right now listening are not taking climate change seriously. I promise you. Um, because if we did, we would be doing things totally differently. And we would talk about it like the existential threat that it is, which is to people's lives and not sort of to the world. Um, and the most shocking stat I recently heard um, is about overshoot day, which I had never heard of, but I'm really glad somebody put up. Um, Earth overshoot day marks the day when humanity's demand for ecological resources exceeds what the Earth can regenerate in a year. So that means that we are stealing from the Earth in a way that we can't redo in one simple year. Um, and so when the U.S. hits this mark year, in... Right, so what? every year... It happens yes. each year. It's something that every year calculate what day we have used up the resources for that whole year. That's right. And so this last year, we the um, Americans passed the day where we took from the Earth more than it can regenerate in one year. So uh, on March thirteenth, March thirteenth, three months in, we have taken more than the Earth can redo. We are ahead of just about every other country, and the average um, for the country, the average for the world was August 2nd. I don't know, that just like hit me. That's yeah. a and lot, speaking of, a lot of, of consumption. And the world, like, we may be the first to do the crime, right? We're, we're the people who are committing the most in terms of causing climate change, but we're the last to do the time. Because all these other countries where either they're island nations 
or they're more susceptible to heat waves, or they're just, they don't have as much money as we do, and they cannot afford for every single person to have an air conditioner and all that stuff, you know, they are suffering. They're going to suffer before we do. But it's really just like, it's also just a like consumption. It's it's like, it's like not just, it's like, yeah, there's like, you know, there it is the like air conditioner stuff like that, but it's also just like stuff. Like we are buried in stuff and we drive a lot. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's just like we, like those, it's not just like, you know, we could, all of those countries could give every single person an air conditioner and they wouldn't pass the plastic that we put our, we like buy. So like, you know, so Jamaica is the latest December 20th <laughs> is right. Um, Ecuador, Indonesia, Cuba, right? But they're also doing things like solar energy. Uh, they like have public transportation, they walk. And also there's poverty, right? There's things that we're doing to keep people um, who aren't in industrialized world um, continually to be there. Like we take from them and, and don't allow people to grow. So there's all those things mixed in, but it's a lot of our culture in our society. Yep. And I, and I think that it speaks to as well, the um, the mention of poverty is the fact that for those who are like, when we see a lot of the excessive consumption that exists amongst, amongst let's say like the super rich, if you want to actually be able to kind of, as we should lift up people who don't have as much without like exacerbating kind of other kind of environmental stresses, that means that the rich people need to consume less that they need to just fundamentally take up less, need to take up less environmental space. If you're the type of person who has your like five homes and 10 cars, and also even just general car size for everybody, where it reminds me of how, this I looked at the stat where the average car sold in the US is about 20% more than the average in Europe. And that's something Wait, that has been driven which I'm shocked it's even just that low because I would honestly think it's larger. 20% uh, like larger? 20 yeah, 20% like larger. Ah, what was that? Yeah, and that it's um, something that's been exacerbated both by consumer demand where people just end up liking, liking the larger cars as well as even the way in which a loophole in and kind of US regulate kind of US regulations on automobile emissions has incentivized the creation of SUVs because they can be labeled as trucks. Right. They can get around that. Um, and I, you know, you're kind of leading towards something that we wanted to talk about, which is this question of whether, you know, this is really, oh, there's nothing we can do. We just gotta, you know, try and get government to change things and pressure corporations because it's really none of our choices matter, blah, blah, blah or mm -hmm. whether like we really drive what uh, co companies are creating through our choice, through our consumer choices um, and how much we can have an effect on the things that, um, that are created through our culture, through American culture. Um, and mm -hmm. I want us to touch on that for a little bit. Um, I mean, I certainly, I think all of us probably um, do believe to an extent that like we've got to get the government to step in. We're never going to save this thing without some action um, from the government. But that doesn't mean that um, individual actions are not helpful. Um, and uh, Jordan, I know you you wanted to talk a little bit about um, fast fashion and how much that affects um you know, how much of what a carbon footprint that has. So. Yeah. So, you know, for those who don't know, fast fashion is basically the idea that you would, um, <laughs> that thing that you, uh, that, that um, things change really quickly. It's really big on TikTok um, and it's really cheap clothing um, that gets discarded really, really quickly. Um, and so, you know, the thing, the companies that you can think of that are big for this are Primark, Sheen, H&M, ASOS. So these are some of the big corporations that do fast fashion, um, uh, Zara. And so, you know, uh, this is a huge carbon footprint from the production of it to the shipping it to you across the world to actually most of it doesn't get worn or created because they're what they're doing is, well, it's called fast fashion because they're creating their, um, things end up on the runways more often than they used to. And then people are re and then rich people buy it and then sell it a cheaper version gets made really quickly. So somebody could get Kim Kardashian's dress that she wore to something that she put on Instagram, a cheaper version really mm -hmm. quickly or um, a trend on TikTok. Something gets big on TikTok and then, um, and then people be like, I want to buy it, but they don't want to 
pay they want to buy a cheaper version so they buy the cheapest version possible um and then they and then they go through it and so this is real um really big impacts just to just to quantify it um so 60 percent so people have so just between 2000 and 2014, so just not a lot of time, right? Um, six, people bought 16% more garments and wore them half as long. Mm -hmm. And in 2000, that was already a problem. It was already a problem in 2000, right? So we're, we're just fast tracking the idea that you wear something a few times and then you toss it, wear something a few times and toss it. Um, that culture around it, that sort of H&M culture, is, it has a huge carbon footprint, as well as just being completely evil like it's also slave labor right yeah um, mm -hmm. you know like you know we we often think about the human carnage we see on tv as far away but our actions are causing a daily grind of human carnage um that is invisible to mm -hmm. us but is real nonetheless and fast mm -hmm. fashion is a huge part of it um so just doing so just like um you know the textile contributions to climate change um is more than the aviation and shipping combined. Wow. wow. So fast fashion contributes more to climate change than all the flights and all of the shipping. That's how much it's out of control. And it's just so much consumption. It is so much consumption. Um, and so that's a, just a, it's like, again, it's a, it's a, it's in a culture problem. <laughs> right? yeah. It's and, not a. And I will, mm -hmm. I will mention for folks, you know, we want to give people some tools here every day. Um, folks, you can buy some amazing clothing for like one tenth the price if you get willing to go to Goodwill, Salvation Army, mm -hmm. and these places. Savers. A, I am going to Savers. Yeah, I'm going to advertise right now for a place that I uh, was a member of last year. It's called Swap It in Medford. Um, mm -hmm. And you pay a membership fee and then every you just bring clothes, clothes in and you take clothes and you never charge anything. You can come every single week, bring a couple clothes, take a few clothes. It is amazing, and it's really a wonderful. Community. There's a there's a good swap um, here in Worcester that does the same for women. Um, my my uh, my wife Kara, she only buys used clothing for that reason. She buys one piece of new clothing every year, but like that's it. So I just think yes, like thrift, please make thrifting cool. <laughs> like that's it's the best thing. So you you want to hit climate, that's like make an thrifting cool. Way to save money. You know, with all this inflation and everything, it's so fantastic on the pocketbook. Um, yeah. And the, the, the dynamic that we were talking about, as well as the dynamic of how we both need individual actions and we need upstream actions. Um, I'll give an example I had noted before about bottled water. Is that like, we know fundamentally that like plastic is bad for the environment. Uh, bottled water create, that creates a lot of plastic waste. Plastic isn't great for recycling to begin with, even if you do recycle it, because there's no market for recycled plastic uh, in the way that there's a market for recycled cardboard or recycled aluminum. And, yeah, but I want to touch like, on that for one second before you go on, because people yeah. think that plastic is recycled. And I think the statistic is that only 9% of plastics are ever recycled each year. And yeah. It and, is, so, and, it, and like black plastic, for example, never recycled, even if it's also something on there. It's also when when you say recycled, it's also important to note that you need virgin plastic to recycle plastic. So the there's actually yeah. no such thing as recycling plastic. I think it's actually important to say that. Like it's there are some yeah. plastics, some really hard plastics that like can be recycled, but basically almost every piece of plastic you touch can needs more plastic to be recycled. So even the yeah. process of recycling requires plastic. Um, you know, for not all of the, like, don't add us. Yes, there are some plastics that you can actually recycle, but most of the plastics we're engaging and certainly bottled water is not one of them. And, and, and so the thing with bottled water then becomes if ultimately what as, as some environmental advocates have, have advocated for in the past, it, bottled water just should not be something kind of sold regularly in stores. It, it's something that's necessary in like an environment, like if, if you have like a disaster situation and you have, a, or you have a sanitation problem, that it's something that's like a clear emergency need, but it is not an everyday, it is not something that needs to exist in every, every day. We should just have more filling stations and like, feel free to give everybody some reusable, like spend the money on giving everybody a reusable container. Uh, that, however, that like we both need people to stop buying bottled water to actually say, kind of bring down that market share and we need to regulate it. And if we're never going to get regulations 
on the availability of bottled water if we don't change people's mindset into viewing it as something that they should that they expect to see everywhere well because that they that, will, you, that that you won't have the demand for a le for a legislative change or a, or a store policy change and you will instead help basically anybody who's trying to fight that change by making people feel like that they're losing something by it not being taken away and I, I want to jump in and talk about um, microplastics, which, you know, mm -hmm. more and more studies are coming out saying that microplastics are in newborn babies. Microplastics are in like throughout our bodies. They don't, you know, really have a way to understand like how they're getting, where they're getting. And, and mm -hmm. a bunch of new studies showing that they're very unhealthy. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you're drinking bottled water and you're drinking microplastics. So, People should understand that I, bottled water is just unhealthy for you. Aside from the fact that it's just tap water, like you both. Know, it's not even good not tap even water. Good. I just, I don't want to. I won't name the company because it's because uh, you know I want to get sued. But we, um, I when I was in rural Pennsylvania, um, I I lived in rural Pennsylvania in high school, and um, and we and there was a pig farm, and a cow farm. Um, and I don't, if you don't know anything about these farms, they are super gross, especially pig farms. They're super gross. Um, they're re there's a lot of excrement. They smell terrible. It's awful. And they were on hills. Um, and down at the bottom of that hill was a stream that a water company that's big, that people buy in stores, got its water from. <laughs> and I think about that every time I see people pick it up. And I just think, whatever your problem with tap water is not this water. And like, that's the thing, right? Like <laughs> Fuji water is some of the worst quality water in the world. And they're, and they've successfully sold it to us as like, oh, look at this magic. And it's just like awful. It is awfully, it's awful quality water. Um, who's ever heard of good beach water? Like, it's not a thing. And like, it's just, you know, and so like, it's, it, it's good marketing, right? It's like good marketing to people. Um, but it's not, it's not based in reality. And so, because the, the, the thing most people say is like, oh, well, like my tap water isn't good. And I was like, well, first, do you know that it's not good? Like, have you seen studies? Have you studied it? And then have you studied your, the bottled water that you're getting? Because it's, probably worse if not from the same source <laughs> yep oh as a as a quick aside to speak to the like the importance of good regulatory policy when i was in florida recently and the water was disgusting uh like their tap water was disgusting my immediate thought was that this tastes like republican governance <laughs> uh, <laughs> because they like in, in their lander area they have a high rate of sulfur in the water that they just allow and so it really does have a light rotten egg aftertaste uh, that you have to boil it to get it to taste good, which is what I ended up doing. <laughs> uh, but that's like, it's just clearly a failure of Republican governance in the state of Florida. Amazing. But continue on. Well, with <laughs> the other thing with plastic, you know, it drives me crazy how many things you buy that are wrapped in plastic, wrapped in plastic. Like it's, yeah. it's we have an insane plastic culture where like everything, you know, I was buying a tea from Trader Joe's and every single tea bag is wrapped in plastic. I was like, yeah. what, what is happening here? It's crazy. It's totally unnecessary. It's bad for your health. Um, and boy, is it bad for the environment. It's so bad for the environment. Like, it's just so, I think um, plastic was, was heralded. It's like this magic thing. But what we're learning through is that the actual is that there are so many pieces through the process from the fact that it's made from oil to the process of creating it is heart is carbon heavy to the fact that it 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 doesn't go away um and when it does go away it breaks down into smaller pieces that are dangerous at every level so it doesn't get uh -huh. recycled it has problems in its recycling processes. It it doesn't um when it breaks down that breakdown process is dangerous to us humans like its breakdown process is bad for us um and uh -huh. so uh yeah it's just like i think that's an important thing and it's in everything it's in like plastic they put um you know like your receipts now have plastic your um like they just the plastic is added to so many things that does not need to be added to but this is the Koch brothers this is you know if you hate republican governance all that plastic is paying for it Yep. You know, let me pause for a no, moment there before we go on and just say that uh, in case you can't tell, we are not corporate funded. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, and, uh, and we could always use your donations if you, uh, if you think it's important to have progressive media sources um, talking about these things that you won't hear anywhere else. Uh, the link is below. Just drop us, say, you know, five bucks for your cup of coffee. Uh, do it once a week. That'd be amazing. Or, uh, you know, drop us a thousand dollars if you happen to have an extra thousand dollars. It really, none of us get paid, but it really helps to support um, the young uh, uh, professionals who do um, our graphics and our editing and our, you know, design services and all of that stuff. That would be amazing. Um, back to, I'm going to just bring up a little bit of a broad topic and talk about, you know, the fact that we talk not we necessarily, but uh, in American culture, the way we talk about climate change is to tie it almost always to carbon footprint, right? Um, and, the, and that's the way it's discussed, but there are mm -hmm. other things that truly matter. And I think plastic is one of those things, like the creation of plastic, constantly mm -hmm. creating more and more and more and more, you know, plastic that can, that has a, you know, lifespan of thousands of years um, is very, very bad for the environment. It is tied to another aspect which is biodiversity like we are we are in the sixth uh -huh. extinction um species are going extinct every single day um and you know we this is dangerous for the planet um really a huge problem uh, and the third thing that i want to bring up just talking about things that are not just carbon right um the third thing i want to bring out up is other greenhouse gases um and specifically methane um, and, you know, I'm going to say something unpopular. I did a, um, a presentation, man, this is so long ago, like 15 years ago at a job that I was at, I did a presentation on, um, it was on your footprint, right? Uh, your greenhouse gas footprint. And it was like the 10 things to change to lower your greenhouse gas footprint. And numbers one and two were very unpopular, right? <laughs> numbers one and two of the biggest things that you can change are don't fly and don't eat meat, <laughs> right? Reduce the amount that you fly, reduce yeah. the amount that you eat meat, um, meat tied very much to, um, to methane, uh, greenhouse gas, which is like, I don't know, between 50 and 80 times more powerful than, uh, than carbon dioxide in terms of its greenhouse gas ability to raise the temperature of the earth. Mm -hmm. I just want to bring those things up because people talk a lot about carbon uh, and I think there are other important issues. I'll I'll just say like, and those, those are, those are, there's some simple decisions you can make that really come up with this. So I recently um, went to DC and I was asked how to get there and, the, and they're like, oh, we can fly you. And I was like, can I take a train? Like, is there, is there a small decision you can make that would make better? Like, it's not, you know, I think sometimes people hear don't eat meat and they, and they're like, oh my God, I can't eat meat. And so I will say like, first off, if you don't eat meat, that's great. Like I don't eat meat and you, uh, I don't know, I'm ginormous. Like you'll be fine. But also if you want to eat meat, think about like what meat you're eating, how often you eat it. If you just consume less <laughs> meat, if you increase the amount of plant-based meat in your life. So my parents are meat eaters, but they... Um, the majority of the time they eat plant-based meat and then they eat meat sometimes when they have a, when mm -hmm. they feel like they want to have it. So there's like ways that you can, um, you know, the other thing is if you buy plant-based meat and bring it and put it into your diet more often, then that signals to corporations, we do live in the system, that they should pr produce mm -hmm. more of it. So there's lots of like, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? Like just, you know, moving, if um, substituting uh uh, chicken for beef yeah, and substituting plant-based for chicken um, those yeah. in a meal does a huge part right if we just if you just eat less cows if you interact with cows less <laughs> uh -huh. you will dramatically decrease um you know just like that alone that decision alone will dramatically decrease your carbon flow. like and and, uh -huh. and signal again to the to the um to uh to corporations that this is out of control um you know we we I think it's 16 billion. I think I deleted this, uh, the, the thing that had it, but um, how many animals, I think it's 16 billion are raised in to, or 8 billion are raised a year and killed. Here it is. 18 billion. We raise 18 billion animals a year to die. And then we only one in four and one in four of them um, are wasted. So like, they're just, <laughs> there's just like, there's, you could be making, you don't need to make an all or nothing decision. You could be making some simple decisions to move in the direction. Again, these all matter. Absolutely. And I would say as well, the one thing particularly when it comes to the, like, the agricultural industry is that 
there are like but there are so many problems and if we can move them in a way that is actually more ecological sound it's also easier to move them in a way that are like better treats their workers and better treats mm. other aspects of the environment because particularly the livestock industry in the u.s is like filled with horrible work like workplace abuses uh from like big ag to their employees bad monopolistic practices uh that kind of abuse from even like the, them to like farmer kind of the like farmers rather than like the farmers that they like the people that they employ but the person who owns the land um and just other forms of pollution because it's poorly regulated and we have such high demand that the the, the kind of the high demand and poor regulation fuse together for it to have a toxic outcome yeah, well, before we end today, um, I have a couple of um, kind of good news stories I wanted to bring up. Um, one is about the coral reefs. You know, I've been hearing for years that they're potentially on the road for extinction in the near future. Um, and I was just listening to, uh, a, you know, a great NPR podcast, and they were they were talking to some real coral reef experts and saying that they believe that that they will be safe. They believe that you know, with a lot of attention um, and a lot of scientists kind of on the, you know, working toward ensuring that they survive, it looks like um, we will likely save the coral reefs. Um, so I know if you didn't realize they were going to go extinct, maybe this isn't such a happy story, but <laughs> if you were aware, then hopefully this is a little bit of good news. Um, the other piece that I wanted to bring up was this amazing lawsuit where um, a bunch of older women um in uh where were they uh they went to the european court of human rights oh they were from switzerland um a bunch of older 2000 senior women won the biggest victory possible in a landmark climate case um they really showed how they suffered emotionally um from climate change and uh, and the court said that the swiss government did not do enough to curb climate change and so they have to do more. <laughs> that, that was like a really landmark case um, will probably lead to some governmental policy change for the country of Switzerland, which is amazing. Jordan, do you have any uh, last thoughts before we end? Uh, yeah, just like, um, <clears throat> you know, I, we talked a lot about personal decisions, but I just want to remind people that ultimately the other thing they could do is advocate for their government to do better. Like these, like ultimately we won't, individual decision we won't individual decisions fix this problem these are all legislative problems that will have to be fixed and so um you know if you're a legislator take climate change seriously like there's just we need a wholesale rethinking we need to regulate plastic a lot <laughs> uh, more than we're currently doing it needs to be treated like the regular like the um, environmental um, uh, damage that it is and regulated accordingly. Um, and, you know, like there are, and so advocate for that when you call your legislator, um, you know, there's a bunch of people calling for stuff that's happening around the world and in the country, make sure when you call to also say, Hey, also like, um, what's the, what's my person doing for climate change? Is there more to do? So I just want to encourage that there's a lot more that we can and should be doing on it. And um, there's a lot of individual decisions that we can be making, but ultimately the legislatures are going to be the one to make the changes that we need to, you know, get us uh, through climate change. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for listening. We look forward to chatting with you all next week. Hey there. Thanks so much for watching us on YouTube. Please like and subscribe. And it would be amazing if you would also subscribe to us on your favorite podcast player. Just look for Incorruptible Massachusetts wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks so much.